Hey guys, thanks for joining and welcome to our 26th video on ProjectEuler.net. Today we're going to be taking a look at problem number 26, Reciprocal Cycles. So the problem reads, a unit fraction contains 1 in the numerator and the decimal representation of the unit fractions with the denominators 2 through 10 are given below. These values here, they tell us where 0 0.1 with 6 in parentheses means 0 0.166666, etc. and has a one digit recurring cycle. It can be seen that 1 over 7 has a six digit recurring cycle as shown here. They want us to find the value of d less than 1000 for which 1 divided by d contains the longest recurring cycle and its decimal fraction part. So if we're going to solve this, we need a way of mapping a number n or more specifically a number 1 divided by n to some decimal and we need to be able to identify when that part of the decimal is repeating such as in this case or this case. So let's go to our workspace and create a code file so that we can take some notes in a comment block and figure out how we want to solve this. So I'm going to be coding this in TypeScript. If you're not familiar with that language, it's an extension of JavaScript and the syntax is very easy to follow along. So you should have no problem following along during this video. And I'm going to be implementing this in a class, which is not required per se. I just want to take advantage of some common utilities which I've written. Okay, so let's make our comment block and think about how we want to work on this. So let's take the example of one third. Now if we go here, if we just type node and go into the subsystem divide one divided by third, it'll give us this value here, which does terminate eventually. So at first we could think, okay, let's just look for patterns there, but we might run into some issues with that. If we do one divided by seven, so we can see the pattern, but it doesn't complete at the end. There is some truncation going on. I'm thinking we might be in a better spot if we do the division ourselves, so to speak. So let's think about long division, right? If we have one divided by three, and I'll write it kind of like this, so it, so it looks like long division. So we have one divided by three. Now, we don't have anything there we can do yet. So what I'll say is zero point something. So that should be three here one here so three doesn't go into one so we need to make it 10 at which point we divide three we get nine which gives us a result of one ten so we would be back to the same spot so in other words we can actually apply this process itself to determine it because we saw okay we have the same values here and here we multiply by three, get nine. If we do that value again, we'll get the same result. So we can detect a loop that way. In other words, we can solve this by implementing an algorithm for long division and detecting loops within that. Let's first work out how dividing by seven works because the loop is larger in that case. So seven, 10. So if we go along that thought process, this is 27, not 28. If we go along that thought process, we would eventually come back to the situation where we have a one here and a 10. So in other words, we can't just keep track of the last value. We have to keep track of all values in a sequence. In the case of this, for example, it would terminate immediately because we get zero at the end. So we can basically say, okay, if we have a zero, if the result is a zero, this is terminating. So we just return a result. Otherwise, go keep going through this process and we can hope that our number is not irrational, which in this case it won't be because they're not giving us any and it's, and it's fractional division. So all numbers will be rational guaranteed. So, We'll have numerator, denominator, and how should we, what should our return value look like? Let's just say find recurring, find recurring, we'll just call it find recurring for now. So in this case, we'll return a number array. So let's try to implement this long division approach. First, we'll say let sequence is equal to empty array of numbers. And the sequence is where we'll keep track of these one by one. And we need a name for these kind of values. So we have 10 here, 30 here, or we have 10 versus nine. I'll call them subnumerators, subnums. We'll write out the first step first and then make it into a loop or whatever we need to do when it's time. I'll just have a denominator. We'll simplify this. We don't need to implement the full long division. For this case, we can just assume that one is the numerator and simplify our code a little bit. And we'll start with what numerator is equal to one. I'll make a while loop. While well, denominator is greater than numerator, numerator, 
numerator times equals 10. We shouldn't have to use a while loop for that. We should be able to figure out how much larger the numerator is, or the denominator is compared to the numerator and do this in constant time. So if we say one, two, three is greater than one, we need to multiply that by a thousand, essentially one times a thousand. So how do we determine that? We can just say numerator is 10 times math.log math.4 math.log 10 denominator. So let's just try that here real quick. We'll try with our example here, one, two, three. No, not 10 times, 10 to the power of plus one. We need that extra plus one. Okay, so and to the power of this. So that's what we've done here essentially. Three, we had to multiply one by 10, so by adding another zero there to get that value. So in other words, we're raising the numerator. Then we need to find the closest multiple of the denominator to that numerator without going over. So if we wrote that out as a while loop, actually, no, we can just say, in this case, math.4, 10 divided by three times three, that gives us nine. Let sub value is equal to math.4, numerator divided by denominator times denominator. Let sub result is equal to numerator minus sub value. Sequence dot add push sub result. And we need to sub nums dot push num. I'll change that to sub num, sub numerator. Okay, so that has taken care of one step for us. Now what we need to do is to be able to detect a cycle. And what does a cycle look like in this? We know we have a cycle when an entry in sub nums and a corresponding entry in sequence, both of them are repeated in some sense. So in this case, we would have one, 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 it's essentially, or no, we would actually have 10, one, 10, one, 10, one. So just the fact that it was repeated twice. So now we need to make some type of method to determine if there is a cycle. What I'll do is I'll make, instead of using two arrays, I'll use one array, which contains both values. And then we can make a separate method to detect if both values, if there's more than one instance of a single value. So the sequence values is equal to, I want to define it like this, sub numerator number and sub value, sub result number and that's an array, so we'll do that. Then instead of pushing to these things, we push just once to that. Dot push. Sub number, sub result. Now I'll add some type of while loop. What I'll say is while true. You gotta be careful when you're using while true, but I think we can use it in this situation safely. What I'll say is if sub result is equal to zero, return sequence values dot map. No, break. We'll say, we'll say break. Below here, we'll say return sequence values dot map item goes to item dot sub value. Sub result, that is. Sub result will be the actual decimal places. No, no, no. Sub value will be the actual decimal places. So now we have the escape condition for sub result being zero. We need one more for sub result being one. The easiest way to check is to just see if this value already exists in the array. So I'll call this variable new entry. If sequence values dot find and I'm going to use an equals function which exists in one of my libraries called fun script which will just do a deep object comparison so that way we can easily check if new entry equals item otherwise I would have to write out the logic of checking okay if this property equals this property and that property equals that property which this one's a little bit more concise and more readable so with this I theoretically we have the result so let's try this dot find recurring let's try it on the number three first and I'll set the return type to any just for debugging purposes all right let's run it see what we get 
9. Okay, so we're mapping 9. That's the result we get when we do this 3 times 3. What I need to do is, instead of mapping sub value, I think we need to map this one. So, let sequence seq digit is equal to Then we have that. Now I'll save the subnum sub value sequence digit. I'll put the sequence digit right in there. Do this, run it again, we should get three this time. Okay. Now if we get seven, we should get that sequence we see here, this guy. One, four, two, eight, five, seven. Okay, so we have some type of issue going here. Well, let's add a console log to make sure our equals works. But instead there, I'll do it here. And we can set that back when we're done to make it look a little nicer again. So sub number 10, the next sub number should be 30. Okay, so I think it's a sub numerator part we have an issue with. So right now we're raising it as if it were the number one. Let prev sub result, seq values. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to initialize this object we have here, sub numerator one, sub value, one sequence digit zero. I'll just have some initial thing there. So we need previous value dot sub num times 10 to this power. We also need to get the math log 10 denominator minus math dot log 10 sub value dot pre values dot sub value. No sub num. Okay. Let me space this out a little bit better so it's easier to read. And we'll set at the end previous value equals new entry so it carries over. Let's run it now and see what happens. We need to save sub result as well. We might not need to save all of these, we'll come back later and check. For now I'll just include it all. One, four, two, eight, five, seven. Looks like we are good. Run that one more time just to clear the output. Okay, so now what we need to do, first I'll run it over the number nine and we just make sure that we get the actual correct thing there. Okay, now what we need to do is run this for numbers one through a thousand and collect the longest one. So let longest recur n will be the number itself. Longest recur count is the number of digits. And then i recur is this dot find recurring. Denominator will be i. I'll set this to two because one divided by one is not a fraction. If i recur dot length is greater than longest recur count, longest recur count is equal to i recur dot length longest recur n is equal to i. Then we will return longest recur n. Now let's run that, see what happens. 983, let's see if that's correct. Okay, so we got the correct answer. It did take just a little bit over two seconds. I'm wondering if we can do anything to make it faster. First, what I'll do is see if we need to save anything here. Let's say sub value, sub number and sub value. I'm not sure if we need either of those, so I'll get them here. Sub num sub value. Sub num sub value, get rid of it there. Run it again. Now, that should give us maybe a tiny optimization by not saving values we don't need anymore. Another one is this equals here. This is looking over the entire array every time. So I'm going to actually console.log longest recur count.
we have 884 is the longest recurring count. So that means we're doing a lot of extra time. So what I'm going to do, instead of using an array, we can use a sorted list. So in the, some of the previous videos I've discussed this already, I have an open source library, which contains a sorted array implementation, which as we add items to it, keeps the list sorted. So that way when we wanna look up items, we can do it a lot faster than just by, okay, checking every single item if it's equal. So let's take advantage of that. What I'll do is, I'll add one more thing to this here, sub result, sequence digit, sub result, and we'll have index number. So the index will help us map back. Index, I'll just initialize to negative one. And then pre values that index plus one. And now instead of making it an array, we'll make it a sorted list. Let's go to new sorted array. And what we'll do is define our own custom comparison function, which says if sequence if a dot sequence digit is less than is equal to b dot sequence digit, return a dot sub result minus b dot sub result. Otherwise return a dot sub result minus b dot sub result. So that gives us a way of sorting the list as we go. Then instead of doing this find, we can say, I'll comment this out. If sequence values dot contains new entry, break, else sequence value dot add. Then we'll do a sequence value dot, what we'll do is two things. So sequence value dot map, the map implementation on the sequence array is a little bit different than on a regular array. So what we'll do is map it two ways. First we'll map based on a sorting function. So the new, the mapped, Thing itself has to be sorted differently. So we're going to sort this time by the index. So a b goes to a dot index minus b dot index. Actually, instead of doing it this way, we'll sort it and then into a new list. No, no, we'll just return sorted values, sequence values dot to array dot sort. And then dot map, move that on a new line for readability. Item goes to item dot sequence digit. Now, if we run that again, we should get 983, but it should be a little faster. Okay, at that time we got it in 473 milliseconds. So we're already just by that, we're about four times faster than we were before. And just to make a note, instead of returning the numbers themselves, we could just return the length here. And avoid that last step and it should be a little bit faster still. Okay, yeah, marginally fast. So yeah, the reason this is faster now is because behind the scenes when we're checking if the cycle exists, we're using this sorted array implementation to perform binary search in the background. So that way, we save a lot of time each time we have to check. And when we have a sequence of length 884, that saves us a lot of time going through all of that. So I'm satisfied with the work that we've done here. From the outset, we had a solution that was a little bit more efficient than brute force. And from there, we were able to further optimize to make the solution about four times faster than it initially was. Definitely made some improvement there as well. So that covers the content for today. If you made it to the end, please like the video, subscribe, hit that bell icon for notifications for more Project Euler videos. I'm gonna be posting these at a rate of one per day, 12 o'clock noon, until we have 100 videos up, the 100 problems solved. Thanks for watching.